It's good to see everybody here this morning. Um, welcome to Calvary Chapel. Woo, what happened? They're trying to mess with me, aren't they? The guys on the worship, the youth, huh? The youth are messing with me this morning. Uh, didn't they do an awesome job? You know, I just have to, you know, it's not to puff them up, but you know, they practice diligently and uh, before service on Sundays, and oh my goodness, you know, um, they have come such a long way. I am so blessed to be able to worship with them on Sunday mornings on You Servant Sunday. So, uh, man, I was surely blessed. Well, welcome again to Calvary Chapel, and uh, it's great to have you all here. If you're here for the first time, welcome. If you're here for the second time or third time or whichever time after that, welcome back. It's great to have you here. Some vacationers are probably here in the, in, in the congregation this morning, so welcome you vacationers who are here to our, our fair town of Williamsburg, Virginia. It's great to have you all here. I pray you're having a wonderful visit here uh, in our fair little town. I usually, well, I was thinking about an announcement. Yeah, you know what? The, uh, the evangelism class, I, I really encourage you to sign up if it's something that you want just for your own edification, your own building up and, and such like that to, to be equipped. Because, you know, if God is stirring your heart, then he's always going to be giving you the equipping and enabling for it. So as he stirs, as he, as he uh, does that, then, uh, yeah, sign up for the class because you just never know what God's going to do. In, in your own family, we think of evangelism as like, man, going into the streets and getting a soapbox and then staying on a corner and saying, let me tell you about Jesus. You know, but no, it's not the only thing. That's not the only gig that there is out there. But what the Lord is doing is also maybe calling you to, to minister to your family inside and evangelize to them. So this will give you some definite great equipping, I believe, as Pastor Greg uh, does the Harvest Crusades all throughout the nation now and throughout the world, going into Australia and going into New Zealand, going into Philadelphia, North Carolina, all throughout California. Um, he's just gifted, gifted, gifted evangelist. And uh, it's just a blessing to have him. Uh, he's going to be with us but he's going to be with us on DVD. So it's going to be great to be equipped by that. So it's going to be a blessing. So I encourage you to sign up on the back table. Um, there's going to be definitely room for all, and there's absolutely zero, zero cost for that. So, And there, as I understand, there's going to be some child care uh, provided for you parents. If you want to bring your little ones, regardless of the age, please, please, please don't let that be a hindrance to you uh, or as even a second thought, but just show up. We'll have child care provided for you. Amen? Amen? Woo, okay, just make sure you guys are awake this morning. It's not that late, it's only 11 o'clock, here we go. Matthew chapter 20. Let's get into the word this morning. Let's pray before we do. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that as we are continuing through your word, Lord, verse by verse and line by line, Lord, that you continue to illuminate to us and bring to us revelation by your Holy Spirit. That, Lord, it's by your Spirit that we are uh, able to see and able to hear things that are from you. Without your Spirit, God, we are, we are deaf. We cannot hear. And our hearts, Lord, are not ready to receive. They, we don't have that, that good soil. So, God, prepare our hearts this morning, Lord, uh, by your Spirit. Thank you for the worship, Lord, in the preparation of our hearts and our minds to be single-focused and single-minded upon you because you're the guest of honor here this morning, Lord. You're the one, Lord God, that we exalt. You're the one that we lift up this morning, Lord. Uh, you are the one that we are here to worship and to worship you with our ears and to worship you with our hearts, Lord, this morning. So, Lord, fill us. Fill us to overflowing this morning by your Holy Spirit that we may just receive and be excited about what you have for us through your servant, Matthew, in this gospel. God, minister to our hearts this morning. Give us the ears to hear, the hearts to receive, that which will you, you will give us this morning. Regardless of our standard in life, regardless of our age, regardless of our education, regardless of any equipping we've had or not, your Holy Spirit, God, will do the equipping for us, Lord. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 20, I left off last week at Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. Because verse 30 follows suit right into chapter 20, verse 1. In the, 
Greek, there's no punctuations, there's no smaller case, upper case. There was no chapter breaks in the original writings. And so as Jesus now is still speaking to the disciples, Peter had asked him a question back in verse 27. And the question he said was, See, we have all left and all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? He asks. Peter the Apostle asking Jesus, What shall we have? We have left everything for you, Jesus. Everything, everything. Well, Jesus is going to now give Peter and his disciples a parable. A parable that Jesus, we've been studying in parables through Matthew, as it, Jesus makes things very applicable for you and for me to understand what he's talking about and what's on his heart. We have to admit many times the disciples have asked Jesus a question and he'll come back with an answer and we even go, huh? Now why would he say that? It's just like doesn't make any sense. It's not correlating. It's not parallel to their answer or to their question. But here, as Peter asks him a question, he ends in verse 30 Chapter 19 by this, but many who are first will be last and the last shall be first. Chapter 20, verse 1, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. We see that and we know that in the final day that there will be some surprises happening and going on. And the rest of this chapter now as Jesus speaks and introduces to us about the kingdom of heaven and what it's like, making it very practical for us to understand. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, someone who owns land, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Really simple concept. I remember seeing it a lot in California where I came from, especially in Southern California with a large Hispanic population. You have what's called day laborers. They're standing on the corners of Home Depot and Lowe's and those places. And guys would come up in their trucks needing day labor help. And so they'd come by and they'd say, okay, I want you, 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 hop in the back. And they would hop in the back and then they would bring them on back to, their lo to that location. And so it's no different. People needing work, people needing to, to have that labor to be paid for the job well done. It's the same back here in the times of Jesus. These guys are standing on the corner of their, you know, little Lowe's or whatever that is, or Home Depot of the time, in the, in the main square. That's where everything happened and probably near the gate of the city where all the happenings were. So we see here then that uh, as he continues to speak to us about this time of harvest, it was a time of harvest because he's speaking about a vineyard and it was a time to reap. He needed laborers. He needed guys to be out there to reap this harvest. So it's even done in the ancient days as it's done today in the hiring of day laborers. Verse 2 goes on to say, Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, important to note here, that word agreed. Agreement means that there's a contract. There's an agreement between this vineyard owner and these day laborers for the price or for their fee for the day, what they're going to be paid. Now, it's interesting as we go back even to chapter 19, verse 27, Peter himself, he also wanted a contract of some sort. He says, Lord, he says, see, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? He looks as this is like a contract, yet, Jesus goes on to say, Assuredly, I say to you in verse 28 of chapter 19, 
that in the in, that in the regeneration when the son of man sits on the throne of his glory you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit life or have eternal life. Jesus is saying, hey, it's much more than a contract that we're agreeing to. It doesn't even come into that realm. But this gift that I have to give you of eternal life and salvation is much more precious. And he says, what you're going to have far outweighs any day labor, any denarius, but it's going to give back and you will receive 100-fold and inherit eternal life. So no contract is given for we as Christians. We're not to be looking for Jesus and coming to him as a contractual agreement saying, okay, Lord, I've come to you. Woo, I'm so good. I've come to you, Lord, because you've been after me for such a long time. Now, what are you going to do for me? It's not a contract that we enter into with our Lord Jesus, with our Savior. He saved us. He's given us eternal life. What more could we ask for? What more could we possibly want? The blessings of Christ are given to us, I see, as an icing on the cake. I'm not and you're not to follow Christ because of the blessings he desires to bless his children. Yes, he does, and he will. But that's not why we follow Christ. So it's not a contract that we enter in with Jesus. He died on the cross for you and for me. He shed his blood on Calvary for you and for me so that he can give us a gift. There's no contract associated with a gift. He doesn't expect anything in return except he wants you to follow him. And he wants you to be a disciple and be under his discipline. That, that's all he asks. So we see in verse 2 that there's this agreement that is made between the day laborers and the landowner. Now understand as we get into this, this is a picture of the landowner being the Lord. And that harvest, and we are those laborers. So understand as we keep in the context of the scripture, this parable that Jesus is drawing out for his disciples because he's speaking to them. You know, the Lord is the landowner. We are like the laborers and the kingdom of heaven is that vineyard. And so as we read further in verse three, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. So in verse one, he went out early in the morning about 6 a.m. Then it says that um, he went out about the third hour, which would be about 9 a.m. So it's about 9 a.m. after he's already made this contract with these day laborers. And the denarius is equivalent to probably about $20. $20 a day of the time based on its weight in silver. Kind of the minimum wage of the time. And if you compared it to today, minimum wage would be at about $58 or $60. But compared to those times, it would be, again, relative. And it's about $20 is what we're looking at. Maybe $25. But he sees then in verses 3 and 4, actually, and he said to them, verse 4, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. It's really cool here what we see the Lord saying. and It's subtle, but maybe you've already picked up on it. In the beginning, verse 2, there had been an agreement between the day laborers and the landowner for a denarius, for a day's work. He then sees these other guys standing idle in the marketplace and he says, you also go into the vineyard. You go too. But then he says, whatever is right, I will give you. There's no contract being given here. He says, whatever is right, I will give you. Remember, he's the landowner and he's bringing them in 
after the customary time of when they would normally start work. Verses 5 through 7, he says, Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, that being noon and 3 p.m., and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, which is about 5 in the afternoon, 5 p.m., almost the day is done, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? Verse 7, they said to him, Because no one has hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and what does he say? And whatever is right, you will receive. Again, to the second and third grouping of individuals, he says, whatever is right. No contract is again given. Now, it's interesting as as we see that this landowner, and if we look at it as a picture of even Christ and and ourselves and the kingdom of heaven is like, well, why is this landowner even at five in the afternoon saying, coming to the marketplace and looking for guys to help? Well, remember, it's a time of harvest, so he needs men. He needs men. He needs a lot of them to, to reap this harvest. But one of the things that shows us, and quite specifically, is I believe the Lord always wants us to partake in his vineyard. As we see this as a picture of the the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus says, it's like a vineyard. That's the vineyard and the laborers are ourselves and the landowner is the Lord. The Lord always, always is looking for an opportunity for us, you, to participate and partake in his vineyard. No matter what season we are in life, no matter what age we are in life, no matter how much we know or how much we don't know, how equipped we are or ill-equipped we are, it makes no difference. Jesus is always saying, come, partake in my vineyard. And Jesus here is, and this landowner here is coming at five in the afternoon and still bringing guys into the vineyard to partake, to participate with what was going on. Jesus is always inviting you and me to come and work in his vineyard. Verse 8, So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. So, in other words, the the, the, the last guys that he hired, he's going to give them their wages first. Last, they're going to get paid first. Now, every day in that culture was payday. According to the law of Moses, they were to be paid for a day's work. In fact, if you go anywhere other than the United States, you see that people are also paid daily and or at the outset, weekly, but they also buy their groceries daily. Everything they do is on a daily, daily matter. Here, in the ancient times, would be the same thing. That every day was payday, and that was also according to the law of Moses. Verses 9 and 10. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each receive a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. So what's happening here? Real simple. The guys who were hired last were paid first. The guys who were working first were paid last. But the rub is is that they were all paid the same. Common sense would dictate that, well, if I'm working more hours than someone else, my counterpart, and that counterpart, that coworker, came in an hour before quitting time, that my wage would be, I'd be paid more. But remember, in the very beginning that we read, there was an agreement already made that a denarius would be paid for a day's wage. And whatever was right was to be paid to the others. And so this denarius 
of $20 or so was being paid to everyone. Verses 11 through 15, and when they had received it, they complained against the landowner. Why are you only paying them this? Verse 12, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us. You have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Verse 15. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? Interesting part of scripture here is we see that the landowner has made this decision. And these other guys who's worked in the beginning, who he made the agreement with, they were not happy. They complained against the landowner. Now understand this, that there are two absolutes in this world. Two only. The first one is God is God and we are not. Those are two absolutes in my book. He is sovereign. As we're looking at this again, why am I talking about it this way? Remember, this is a picture of the kingdom of heaven. You and I as laborers. The Lord is the landowner. So God is sovereign. He being that sovereign landowner, he does what he wants, when he wants, and he does, and whatever he does is all right by him. But a lot of times it's not all right by us. That's where we get kind of, you know, saying, Lord, this isn't fair. Lord, this isn't right. Well, in our own finite minds and eyes, there are things that do and do not seem right according to our own eye. But according to the Lord, he has a much different plan. For whatever his plan is, he will allow. Sometimes we even see people that are on their deathbed and they receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Man, God has been gracious and he's poured grace on that person's life at the last instant and that person is able to accept Jesus Christ as his, his or her Lord and Savior, and they are saved. But that's not fair. Here I've been a Christian since I was 15 years old, and, and I've done all this and gone through all that, and I've worked this way, and I've done that for the Lord, and man, this person just gets to get right in. Who's the landowner? Who gives whatever is right? Who is not in a contract? We've got to remember that. God is sovereign. And sometimes as that happens, and you know, we, we who serve God all of our lives, and they enter into eternal life like that. The last I remember, eternal life is only God's to give. It's his to give to whom he wants and to when he wants and how he wants. To whom he pleases. And if those who are in the last moment of their lives come into the kingdom of God, God definitely rewards them. He rewards them with eternal life and they receive their reward for their place in the kingdom of God. There's no doubt about that. Unfortunately, though, folks like that have missed the blessing of knowing God, experiencing God and serving God all of their lives. They have missed out because it's at the last minute they say, I want you, Lord, but they haven't served him. They haven't seen the blessings of God. But God is still sovereign and God will still give to whom he chooses eternal life. But I believe truly that in this parable that Jesus is teaching also that a person at the end of the road can turn. It doesn't matter 
where you're at. I just pray, and that's the whole thing. People will say, well, I'm just going to live my life this way, and then before I die, guess what? I'm going to accept Jesus. A lot of people live their lives that way. But I say to that person, how do you know that God's going to give you that opportunity at that time? It may be sudden death. It may be death in your sleep. It might be a radical crash on the street. You might be run over by a herd of deer. (laughs) I don't know. It might be something that is like, oh no, and then you're dead. You can't take chances with your life eternally. If you're here this morning and you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, accepted that beautiful gift of salvation, I believe this message is for you also this morning. As Christ has died for you and he's given you this gift, do not wait until it's too late because you may not be given the opportunity. And then that's it. Then you are eternally separated from the love of God for all of eternity. And I don't have to tell y'all how long eternity is. So I I do believe that God in his grace, because this particular portion of scripture also speaks of the grace of God. His graciousness and his grace in the lives of of, of us, of we who, who don't get it. I wasn't saved until I was 30 years old. What grace God has poured on my life. He could have wiped me out long before and I could have been eternally separated from him. But because of his grace, he allowed me to give my life to him at age 30. That's what this speaks of also is his grace that he pours over us, that we can make a turn in our lives no matter where we're at. That 11th hour 5 p.m. coming to Jesus. Man, we have a gracious God. And then we get to receive in that share, that equal share of the kingdom of God. See, and that's why it's not about works that gets us into heaven. It's not about that. It's not about what we do here on earth that we're going to be put in a particular station up there, a hierarchy in heaven. It's not about that. It doesn't work that way. Works will not get you to heaven and it is not works that gives you a place or a station in heaven. But it's just by giving your life over to Jesus Christ and letting eternity begin here on this place as you serve him. Because this also speaks in the area of service to God and Jesus is gonna speak about that towards the end of this chapter about being a servant unto the Lord. It believes, it teaches us not only, and I do believe this in this particular portion of Scripture, about that we can turn at any time, even that 11th hour, but we share the the, the riches of eternal glory with our Lord, but it also shows that we can be rewarded for our faithfulness, our faithfulness in Christ, persevering, hanging in there, not giving up, but being steadfast and being true to the calling that God has placed upon your life. And that is to worship Him and to serve Him and to be a light for Him. If I'm faithful for an hour, if I'm faithful for 12 hours, it's to be my faithfulness at the Lord or my faithfulness to the service that the Lord has called me to. Regardless of the length of time, I am to be faithful for the time he gives me and you are to be faithful for the time he gives you. We think many times men like maybe Billy Graham or even Pastor Chuck Smith, those men who are written about on the front pages of the newspapers and in the back pages of the newspapers and have books that they've written and you all love their teachings and you watch the Billy Graham classics on TV on Sunday night. You know, I've done that. 
You think of guys like that who are going to, when they die and they go to heaven, oh my goodness, you know, they're going to be given so much. But remember, the reward that you and I receive in heaven is equal. There's going to be some lady that I've never heard of or that you've never heard of or somebody that the Lord is going to call. You're going to say, who is that? Man, you're going to hear about everything that that person has done in their life for Jesus while they were here. Someone who's never made the front page. Someone who's never ever made the back page of anything. Someone who's never written a book. Yet they have served faithfully for the Lord all the years of their life. There is much reward in that. Much reward, says the Lord. The Lord points out here in this particular portion of Scripture that he can extend grace to whomever he chooses and whomever he pleases. And ultimately, it's because of his to give. That's why. Verse 16. So the last will be first, Jesus says, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Remember who the Lord is still speaking to here. He's speaking to Peter and his disciples and and to you and to me. And in this short little scripture, in this verse 16, Jesus is saying, listen guys, just be faithful. Just be faithful. Greatness will take care of itself. And reward will take care of itself. And so will the life to come. If you or I want a contract with God, (laughs) okay, Lord, I'm coming to you, so I do this, you do that, I do this, you do that. You know, one for me, two for you, two for me, one for you type of thing. We are going to be disappointed disappointed because it's not about contractual agreements with our Lord. Jesus says that if you trust the reward to me and trust me to be gracious to you in the age to come, that's where you'll be blessed and that's where you'll be pleased in the relationship you have with me. He says, just trust me. Trust me with your life. Trust me with the reward that I want to give you. Trust me with the grace I want to give and pour upon your life. You and I have such a hard time understanding grace because it's not easy for us. But God gives grace upon grace upon grace to us. Think about your wretched life and my wretched life. We are all messed up. Yet God has still continued to bless us. Yet God still continues to pour his grace on your life and my life. Why? I don't know. Who's on first? He's on second. I don't know. That was a joke, actually, guys. (laughs) Any Abbott and Costello fans here? Come on. All right. I have no idea. But that's the kind of God we have. That's the kind of Jesus that we've fallen in love with. It's all about his love. It's all about his grace. He pours grace in your life because he loves you a most unlovable people. And the angels are always scratching their hands, their heads going, you did what for them? They're not worth it. You sent your son to die for those people who curse you, who mock you. 
who don't listen to you, oh my goodness, their job is to listen to him and to praise him, to obey him 24-7. And they look at us and go, my goodness, you died for them. What grace and what love. Those who have a legalistic relationship with God where everything they do is, okay, God, I've done this, now it's your turn. Well, they're miserable. They're miserable because I used to have a very legalistic relationship with the Lord until he opened my eyes at some point to understand a portion and a small part of his grace And I was miserable, miserable in my relationship because I did not get his grace. Understand his grace. Understand his love. Verse 17 through 19. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them. So he's saying, hey boys, come here, come here, you guys. I want to talk to you. He says, behold, we, and he says something very serious here. This is their third and final trip to Jerusalem. And he says, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify and on that and that and the third day he will rise again Jesus is continuing it's not the first time Jesus is continuing to prepare his disciples his 12 his men on what's before them and what they will witness in Jerusalem what he tells them is in their opinion or in their understanding, inconceivable. And we see this because the next verse and what happens and the questions that are asked and what's on their mind. But here in this verse, these 17 through 19, Jesus is telling them of the next work that God is going to be doing. The very next work. And what is involved and what's going to happen. He's handed over and he's condemned and he's mocked and he's scourged and he's crucified. And I mean, wow, he's telling them everything here. Everything he's telling them. But why aren't they floored? Why aren't they like, what? You mean, you're serious, Jesus. We've heard you in the past, but we're almost there and you're now telling us this? You're kidding me. They don't seem to be distressed. They don't seem to be confused. They don't seem to be asking questions. There is one question that's asked, but it's not by either of any of the disciples. But here's what's on their mind. Verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. You moms, gotta love ya. Advocates for your children and how wonderful that is. And you can only imagine, and it tells us in one of the other gospels too that the boys were putting their mom up to this. And they were there right behind her. Yeah, mom, you go up and ask Jesus. He'll talk to you. He'll give you and whatever you want. And the way that she's asking this question in verse 21 or in verse 20 is, is, is a question that is one that is like, gee, Jesus, you're just going to give me anything I want, right? Whatever I ask, right? We who have children, you parents who have kids, or if you have grandkids or nieces and nephews, they come up to you and they go, gee, Uncle Tommy, you know, you're going you're gonna to give me whatever I want, huh? Well, that depends. It's my word. But that's their expectation. You're just, because I'm so cute, and I'm just so cuddly, and 
you just love me so much and you're going to give me anything I want. That's the way she's, not that way, but that's the way she's asking it. Jesus, you're going to be able to do, give me whatever I want, aren't you? Like a child going to a parent. Verse 21, and he said to her, what do you wish? Great question. She said to him, grant these, that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand, one on the other on the left, in your kingdom. So, she's saying, I'd like you to give them the top two seats in the kingdom next to you. Verse 22 Jesus answers them, answers the mom, and says, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to, about to drink and be baptized with a baptism that I, am to, that, that I am baptized with? They said to him, The boy's in the back. We're able. Imagine mom's asking the question, all of a sudden he gives them this, this question, and they're like, sure we are, Lord. We're able to do that. Well, these two sons of thunder, James and John, we know that James was martyred. We know that John lived out a natural death, but staying his time out in Patmos, but they, nor I, nor you, could ever drink the same cup that our Lord drank. They didn't even think about what he was saying previous. It didn't even register in their minds about what he said and why they were heading to Jerusalem. It didn't even click. Verse 23, so he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. It's up to the Father. So Jesus kind of rebukes them here. says, it's not my call. It's not up to me, but it's up to the Father. Verse 24, and when the ten heard it, can you imagine the ten? Oh my gosh. Have you ever been in a group and someone asks a question and you're just waiting to hear the answer? Either from that teacher or from that boss or someone in the crowd of authority and it's like, what are they going to say? Gee, I've been dying to ask that same question. What are they going to say? And then after you hear the answer, whoo, I'm glad I didn't ask that question. Man, I'm so glad. Whoo, thank you, Jesus. No, Jesus knew. Every one of these guys had the same Thoughts on their heart as they're close to him, interacting with him. They're with him the whole time and they're wondering, gee, Lord, which one of us are going to sit on your right and your left? I guess they didn't have moms like James and John. So we go on and the 10. You know, it's funny. I don't know, the first thing that came to my mind when I read this was like a, a, a Three Stooges thing. And I'm sorry to say that, but it did. You know how when one of them say something stupid, the other one's other two would hit them? It kind of reminded me of, too, what the, what the disciples were doing. You know, they're, they, it's like they're going, yeah, right. The first they're going, thank you, Lord. Then all of a sudden I go, yeah, man, John, James, come on. Get a grip. You know, boom. Hit them over the head. What are you saying? What happens is, is that they probably wanted to know as well. But I have found that when selfish ambition and self-seeking abounds in someone's life about something, which was happening here, self-seeking, selfish ambition, the heart grows cold and hard and the mind grows dim and numb. They just don't get it. They're ignorant because of the plan, because of their own self-ambition, because of what they want and what they only see. But they don't see the full plan of God. 
So Jesus calls again his guys continuing to himself. I'll say verse 24 again. And when the ten heard, if they, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Verse 25, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who are great exercise authority over them. So greatness in the kingdom of God, Jesus is going to speak to us about a third issue here. Now he's talking about servanthood, being a servant. So I'll say that again. You know, Jesus says, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Verse 26 through 28. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be saved, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Great, underlined, highlighted portion of Scripture. He says, you shall, it will, shall not be done so among you, but whoever desires to become great, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first, let him be your slave. And he goes on to speak about himself saying the Son of Man did not come to serve but to, I'm sorry, to be served but to serve. And then ultimately to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, the organizational charts and the models of the world, the, of the Gentiles, we can say that, shows a pyramid. Anywhere you go in any corporation, any company, shows a pyramid. And the pyramid shows that the one at the top is the one at the top, and all of those at the bottom are the ones that serve the one at the top, the one above them. But the Lord's pyramid is an upside-down one, praise God. It's an upside-down pyramid, and it's the exact opposite. And a Christian's authority, a born-again believer, their, our authority Real authority and influence is directly proportionate to the number of people whom we serve. Let me say that again. You guys look blank. The, uh, the, the, the pyramid is upside down. Real authority, real influence in a Christian's life is based upon the amount of who that individual serves. That's what it's about. It's about servanthood, Jesus says. It's not about you and I being served, but it's about serving others. That's the way it works in the kingdom of God. Remember, Jesus is starting off with the kingdom of God. The context of Scripture is still the kingdom of God. And so he says, real authority, real influence is when, depends on how many people you are serving, not serving you. So, so important for a, for a Christian, for a born-again believer, not to get trapped up in being served, especially for a pastor. People out of the goodness of their hearts and their love for the Lord want to so many times serve the pastor in so many ways. I mean, serve, serve, serve and uplift and uplift and exalt the pastor. And it's like, no. It's not what it's about. You don't exalt me. You don't exalt the pastor. You exalt Jesus Christ. He's the one you exalt because he's the one who saved you, not Pastor Tom. And as we have the Lord in us dwelling, the Spirit of the living God inside of us, then we then, our scripts are flipped and we're no longer a part of that Gentile mentality, but we're part of the kingdom mentality, the kingdom of God, which is saying, how many people are you serving? That's the question. How many people are you serving? Not serving you. That's the way of the world. And churches can get like this to where they just want to just... Do that. 
Always serving the one at the top only. Lessons in real spiritual authority, real spiritual influence. The lessons of servanthood, as we read today, only come from Jesus. The lessons of the greater serving the lesser. Where do you see that in the world where the greater serves the lesser? Always. But where do you see the lesser serving the greater? Not in the world you don't. But in the kingdom of God, when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, when he served the multitudes, we're going to see how he serves them here now in just a minute. A person can have great power and influence, but they can never change a heart. That's why great power and influence comes really truly. A person who has that comes from a person who's a servant first. That's how you change hearts. 29 through 31 goes on to say this. Now they went out of Jerusalem or Jericho. A great multitude followed him. So now a lot of people are following him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road when they heard that Jesus was passing by cried out saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Then the multitudes warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Being that that cry out of of calling him Messiah, Son of David. It's funny that here are these two guys. They're, they're, they're blind. And, and they know that Jesus is coming by them. They cry out to him. And all the people are saying, shut up. You're too loud. Don't say anymore. Be quiet. But what do we see Jesus do? 32. So Jesus stood still. And called them. I want to talk about that for a second. And and if you do, you should underline this. You should just imprint this upon your mind, upon your heart, that this is what Jesus does. Is that when you call out to his name, he's not too busy. He doesn't put you on hold. He doesn't place you on ignore. He doesn't listen to the multitudes. He doesn't listen to them. Jesus is his own man. Jesus knows the calling that God has on his life and what he's called to do. So Jesus stood still. Whatever you need, whatever you're going through, whatever it is, and you cry out to Jesus, And the people are saying, oh, well, stop praying so much. He's heard you the first time. Stop lifting your hands up in worship, crying out to the Lord. You're making a spectacle of yourself. Oh, don't kneel in church. Don't make yourself, don't bring your broken spirit before the Lord. Don't cry out to Him. But when you do, Jesus stands still. And he says, huh? One of my kids just called me. One of my children that are hurting, that that need me. And he listens. That's our Lord. Jesus always stops for a desperate faith. When your faith is so desperately crying out to him and you you yell out to him, he stops. And he says, I hear you. 
I hear you. That's Jesus. That's the Jesus that we follow. When we have such a desperate faith that we cry out. Then he says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want, child? He's there to listen to you. He's there to hear you. Jesus says, you know, you have cried out to me in such a desperate faith and you have just, man, you have made a spectacle of yourself and people are saying to be quiet, but you continue to yell out my name. I'm stopping and I'm hearing you. And now I want to open up the storehouses for you. They're open to you. What do you want me to do for you? When Jesus asks us that question, man, Lord, make my eyes see. That was their desire. They didn't want riches. They didn't want wealth. They didn't want power. They didn't want influence. They just wanted to see. Verse 33, he says, They said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. It's all they asked. So Jesus had compassion, touched their eyes, and immediately, immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. In one moment of time, their lives have been completely changed. Is that not what God does for you and for me? In one moment in time, our lives, your lives have been changed. Some very radically and some they're still being changed. But as you cried out in a desperate faith for God to stop and for him to hear you, he does and he says, what is it you want for me to do? Come into my life. Save me. This is also a picture of these men and being blinded, that you and I too can be blinded even by sin in our lives. And when you and I are trapped in a miry clay of sin and we are blinded and we ask God to open our eyes, He does it then. Immediately, it says, their eyes were opened and they followed Him. You see, that's what happens. And what the Lord is able to do in a human life today is nothing short of miraculous. Whatever you're going through personally, whatever malady physically, and you need the healing of Jesus, call out in desperate faith because he stops. And he hears you. For those of us who have little children or again grandchildren or nieces and nephews. When you hear something go on in the next room like a scream or a crying out. What's your first inclination? You stop what you're doing. And you go run to that child. See, that's the heart of the father. And that's what he does for you. That's what he does for you. Because he loves you. The Lord can heal you of whatever it is. According to his will, he can heal you. He can make the blind see. He can make the deaf hear. He can make the lame walk.
And today, the Lord is able to do a change in your life. If, if you're here today, and you have in the past known that you, you need to have Jesus in your life, you're saying, Lord, I, I know I need you, but I want to wait out the time. I want to wait till I'm a little older. I want to wait till I've enjoyed this and that. Oh, my goodness, friend, don't, don't wait. Jesus, yes, has grace, and he will call you at the early hour and at the late. But we're not guaranteed that. That's, that's the thing. And if you are sitting here today and you are wondering, am I really born again? Born of the Spirit of the living God. Do I really have Him dwelling inside of me? Have I really asked Him to come into my life? If you question that. If you wonder, why don't I understand things so well? Why, why when I read this, I just don't get it? Maybe it's because you're just not born again. And you need to be spiritually discerned to have that, that understanding come into you because the scriptures are quite clear that if you, do, if you are not born again, if you are not saved, you will not have the spirit of the living God in you and you will not be spiritually discerned. You will not know. It would be impossible. And if the Holy Spirit is right here alongside you, he's always alongside you. Even in an unsaved, unchurched state, he's there. If he is prompting you, if he is speaking to your heart, then that spirit can come in you. It's nothing freaky, it's nothing weird, but it certainly is mysterious. The way God works. And I want to take an opportunity now To offer anyone here two opportunities. One is, if you do not know Jesus, and you know in your heart, I mean, you know that you are not a child of God. You are not saved by the blood of the Lamb. Or, if you've gone off track, if you've deviated, You've backslidden. And you know you need to get right with God. You know it. You know it in your heart. Then I'm going to pray for you right now. And if that is you, then I'd want you to raise your hands. Not caring about, just like those two blind men, not worrying about what the multitude said. But, but just continue to cry out, Messiah, Messiah. If you're in a backslidden state, and I also want you to raise your hand. So let's bow our hearts before the Lord.